back to our seats and continue on with our service now. Well, good morning. Hope everyone feels great here. I've certainly had better days. <laughs> I won't sing for you. Well, as uh, Pastor Kerry said this morning, uh, we are celebrating Chaplaincy Sunday, uh, which gives us an opportunity to really honour and celebrate the incredible work of our chaplains that are very active in the community. They really are on the front line. We've got chaplains involved in various areas throughout the community, um, you know, in schools, in sporting clubs and down on the street and, in, and, and some unofficial chaplains as well playing that part in their workplaces. So we've, we've, we're getting a bit of a reputation actually out in the community, being known as that chaplaincy church, which is not a bad thing to be known as, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it's really cool. Um, but Chaplaincy Sunday also serves as uh, an opportunity to uh, not only look at the tasks involved um, or assigned to that title or role as a chaplain, but it also serves as an opportunity to um, look at the, like, to, to shed light, to, to shed some, sp the spotlight really on the value of loving upon our people, loving upon our community and, um, and, ha and ways we can practically support them and come around them and genuinely care for them. And so we're going to explore a little bit more around um, this heart behind chaplaincy this morning. And to do that, we thought there would be um, value in hearing from some of that uh, from one of our chaplaincy families. Um, so I've asked Carlos and Cecilia Gomez to join me this morning. They are a big chaplaincy family, and they're going to come and and um, and speak into this heart with me. Join me in that conversation, and also share a bit about their chaplaincy journey. So why don't you join me in welcoming Carlos and Cecilia Gomez. Well, good morning, Cecilia. Good morning, Carlos. Good morning. Are you guys... Feeling great, fresh. <laughs> How's your voice, Carlos? Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting there. We're here. A bit better We're than me. Through. Yeah, that's Hopefully good. We'll make it through this. Yeah, oh, you will. You will. <laughs> um, look, thank you so much for being willing to join me uh, in this conversation and to explore chaplaincy with us. I, um, I know that you guys will be a great encouragement for us. I'm, I'm really excited to hear a bit about that journey. And uh, just to give you a bit of a background, Carlos actually got involved with chaplaincy a bit over 10 years ago. Is that right? A bit over 10 years ago yeah, 2012. now. 2012. And um, Ceci was a bit more recent, only a few years ago, where she was um, supporting Carlos in that chaplaincy journey and left um, her very secure corporate job in the big city in Brisbane. Um, to uh, come and relocate to Toowoomba and uh, as a family, they really uprooted their whole life uh, to, um, to explore chaplaincy as a family and, um, and then Ceci obviously got involved as well, um, which was really cool. But it all began in 2012. So Carlos, why don't you um, start by just sharing how you got involved in chaplaincy? What was the big draw card for you? Um, yeah, big draw card. That's, um, I think, in all honesty, um, I probably got involved in chaplaincy unofficially way before I started a paid role, I guess. Yeah. And, um, you know, probably for about eight years before chaplaincy, uh, we were involved in youth ministry and church. And I was working at, um, <clears throat> at Bunnings as well. Um, and in that as well, doing a bit of youth, um, youth work, residential care, that sort of thing. Um, but unofficially, as it, uh, I think that it just comes naturally. I found myself at work at Bunnings in different spaces, even at church. <clears throat> People are drawn to you um, more, I guess, because of your ability to listen empathetically and demonstrate some care. And so unofficially, I probably fell into that role way before I knew what chaplaincy was, e was even about. 
and it was, you know, sitting down for a coffee with people at work and suddenly they're opening up about stuff that's going on or, you know, someone's um, mum is unwell and, you know, they're coming to you in the aisle at Bunnings to just have a bit of a chat and they'll, they'll give you the quiet, oh, can you please pray for me? Um, yeah, so unofficially I think that that was the, the start yeah. and then um, I guess the official journey into chaplaincy was um, doing a bit of youth work and realising that, um, that it probably, I wasn't finding it as rewarding working um, in a sector where you couldn't be 100%, I guess, honest about how you felt yeah. toward young people. And I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but that was probably my, the barrier for me, working with young people and just having to follow protocol and follow systems and you weren't allowed to go any, anywhere beyond that. And so uh, listening to the radio one morning um, during a very weird period in my life where I'd stepped away from work completely, decided to finish my diploma in ministry. So I wasn't working, stay-at-home dad, says was working full-time, and I heard an ad on 96.5 about this thing called chaplaincy as I was driving past a state school. And it was the weirdest thing because I drove past the state school and I just thought, oh, wouldn't it be awesome to be able to work in there in some capacity to do with youth work? And then I hear this ad about school chaplaincy and never heard about it before, got online, had a look, and it was like, this just seems like amazing because it's a Christian organisation um, and they're doing this work in school. So that was, I guess, my step officially into yeah. chaplaincy. <clears throat> That's really cool to hear, um, Carlos. Uh, yeah, obviously, you were in, if it was a bit over 10 years ago, you would have been, what, mid-20s, would you say? Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, how prepared did you feel as you um, began stepping? It was a bit of a change of um, going from youth work and Bunnings to stepping into chaplaincy. Did you feel prepared? Was it a place where the school accepted you? You know, all that kind of stuff. I don't think anybody feels prepared no. um, <laughs> when they step into chaplaincy and you've yeah. got a few few chappies here from different um, contexts and you know it's one of those things that you don't even know what it looks like mm. and um, it is quite strange because now I'm involved in the recruitment aspect and it's really weird when you're recruiting people and you really want them to come into chaplaincy but you can't give them a really clear picture of what the role looks like mm. and so for me it was really going into the dark um, I remember going in for a school-based interview with, at the time, the district manager there in Logan and sitting in front of a deputy principal. Um, the principal of the school was in the office next door and I heard afterwards that he didn't want to be in the interview but he was actually listening through his door and um, being asked all these questions that I had no real answers to because I'd never actually worked in a state school context. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was hard um, stepping into it. Um, but yeah, I guess you just hold on to, hold on to um, some of those things that you hear as a believer often and it's, you know, like God prepares you yeah. uh, for what God calls you to and uh, yeah, you just stand upon those things and, and just go with, you know, if you sense that God is calling you into something, I think the, the important thing is to answer that call. Yeah, that call. yeah. yeah absolutely, absolutely. Hey, Cecilia, um, what was it like journeying with Carlos in those early years as he was stepping into that chaplaincy role, uh, especially being, uh, a, you know, a, a young mum yourself? So what was, what was it like for you? I think initially there was a lot of excitement knowing that God had confirmed what he kind of had told us really early on in our marriage. I think really early on in my marriage, God had said that God had called him um, and set him apart for that type of work. Um, so initially there was excitement. And then um, over the years, there were some challenges. I mean, with his chaplaincy role, um, that became not just within the school community. Uh, and he would say we were serving in church. And then um, we would really get to know some of the families. Um, so that would require him sometimes to, you know, um, give up some of his days to go help families. For You know, we've got lots of examples uh, where we, we would actually um, have birthday parties on for our kids or he would, couldn't be there because he was helping um, a family move or, you know, just supporting a family in other, in other ways. Um, so I think, yeah, I think initially there was a lot of excitement and then um, that sort of grew to, like, 
you have to give a little bit more. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge about, you know, we're called to love on others and to be God's hands and feet. Um, yeah. And I think that was a challenge for me was giving up the little time that we had because we so uh, we were involved with so many things. Um, sometimes that would mean that he wouldn't be there. So it was just that maybe not not being as selfish, um, you know, and it's not like he was away all the time, but it was just, you know, some circumstances that were key events that he would miss. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's definitely um, a juggling act, hey? I think that you can go into these things sometimes with that excitement and hype and it's like, you know, God spoke and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff and then reality hits and it's yeah. like, hang on, it's actually, you know, there's, you know we've got to, we've got to work at this, we've got to... Um, yeah. you know, work with we each had, other. And you know, we had little kids, so it was yeah. always just like, yeah, it's just that, that chaos of trying to squish, make sure we're not missing anyone, you know, in, in terms of paying attention to the kids and our family is still standing strong. And I think God really helped us through that, just through making sure we stay connected to him and connected and communicating as a couple. Yeah, yeah, because I think um, we can very easily get... Uh, in those early days, like almost disheartened, but it's almost like you had to give yourself space to figure that out. How do we do this together? Um, but says you, you um, growing up, you know, a career or something that was very important to you, and yes. and also to, as um, an important value within the family yes. um, and your network. And uh, but you reached a point where you gave all of that up uh, to pursue chaplaincy. Yeah. What was it that um, drew you? What was it that compelled you to do that? Yeah, I, I did think about this. Um, and I just wanted to share, like, um, I grew up in a, in a home where, you know, we were refugees here in Australia. We culturally different. Um, and I was, you know, from a very young age, from age from grades five and six, I had already started, you know, helping my parents do, like, delivery of newspapers and stuff like that. So it was a family thing. So really early on in my life, I was exposed to work and school balance. Um, I started work in grade 10, late in grade 10. So it was just, you know, that, that mindset of working and having to be grateful for the job that you have um, with no, you know, I never really thought I'm going to quit and find another one. It was like, I need to hold on to this job um, and be grateful. And, you know, we, yeah. So uh, it was just really instilled in me, you know, hard work, hard work. and. Um, uh, I unfortunately didn't get the opportunity to go to university. I did a traineeship with council and early on in my council years, um, I was really put down by some of the comments and negative things that some of the managers would say to me. Um, so in my heart, I said, I'm not accepting this. And throughout the years, I said to God, I, want, I wanted this job, I wanted this role. Um, and it took a long time to get there, but God eventually put me in this role that I wanted. Um, and you know, it was, it, it's the journey in itself, but um, just before we moved to Toowoomba, I think I'd only just gotten the job a year and a half prior to moving to Toowoomba, I fell pregnant with Zoe. Um, I was, and before we came here, um, I was on maternity leave, but I had this thing inside me where God was saying, it's time to move on. Um, and I've shared this so many times with some people, but um, growing up, my dad would always say, never let go of uh, one, one tree or one branch without being held onto another one. Um, and for me, that was a challenge because I had that in my mindset. Um, so moving here, um, God said, just let go and trust me. So I quit my job. <laughs> um, I was already negotiating how to go back to work. They were very accommodating, very flexible. But I just said, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm done in council and God really confirmed that with so many ways. Um, so I quit my job and our move to Toowoomba um, was just a God move and a God confirmation. Um, when we were moving here, there were three things that I asked for God to do and it was find a home because um, the market, rental market was chaos, starting to get chaotic at the time, uh, find a school for the kids and then the last one was for my job. So we, we were already in Toowoomba and I said, God, I need a job and I looked on um, Scripture Union website um, and there was a job ad for an admin assistant. And um, I said, God, <laughs> this is significantly, different, significantly lower uh, pay than what I'm used yeah. to. And, I, and God just said, just trust me. 
So I did, I applied. The role was advertised in Brisbane, and I said, God, I'm in Tumba, can you please, you know, open a way? And that, you know, over speaking with the people with um, that were recruiting, they were just so amazing, and they were negotiable, and, you know, now I can do my role uh, from here. But, yeah, it, it's, it, like I said, it's a whole journey in itself, but um, I applied for the role, I got it. Um, and then there was a restructure and this role of executive assistant came up and I just said, God, <laughs> is this the time for me to apply? And I applied and I got that job. So the pay went up a little bit and I said, oh God, you're so amazing. Cause to me, that was just something that was important. Um, it was, yeah, just, you know, making sure that our finances were okay and things has always been something that we try and not necessarily focus on, but we need to also make sure that we're okay financially. Yeah, so it was a huge step for me to just let go and just trust God. But God's just continually, yeah, just blessed and blessed um, in that obedience to him. That's beautiful, hey. It just it can, It's almost like you went in blind, yeah. but yet he, um, he really Definitely. moved in that, in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, last year, actually, at our chaplaincy Sunday service, Pastor Jared preached a message and he highlighted that caring will cost you something. Yes. And, um, you know, it'll inconvenience you, it'll, it'll um, delay, disrupt um, plans, but not only ours, but our families. Yes. And um, so caring will cost you something. Has this been um, your experience? As have, you, have you, I imagine you've had some goals or ambitions in life. Has, have, have, um, has this, you know, has this been your experience as well? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if it's cost cost us our ambitions. Um, like I shared before, I think, you know, God, God's had, had a way with us way early on in our marriage. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I guess having our hearts aligned with what he wants us to do has made that easier. Um, I think the cost, the cost is being, being ready, you know, like the whole idea of um, be ready in season and out of season is not just about being able to answer with the word of God or that sort of thing. It's actually a very practical idea. And um, whether it's, it, it doesn't even have a lot to do with chaplaincy. I think it's got to do with the general Christian life. Yeah. You know, like if you're, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you're doing or what space you're working in. And, um, but in, ch- in the idea of, of ministry and chaplaincy or in, in that context, what is it going to cost you in that context? And um, I think that, that the hardest thing is being ready in season and out of season to actually answer the call of God. And sometimes the call is, oh, like Seth was sharing before, it's the things that seem inconvenient. Yeah. Because it's the things that seem inconvenient that frustrate you and that are like thorns in your flesh at times. Um, They're the moments that you have to somehow um, swallow your pride, your selfishness, your own desires, and and you've got to answer in that moment. That's being ready in season and out of season. It's, It's the moment that someone is maybe not being so nice to you and, and, and you're like, well, what, what would Jesus do? Really, what would Jesus do in this situation? It's a moment where your little girl's birthday, you know, happens to be on that day and like Seth said, you know, that, that was quite an important uh, moment that she was sharing there because I, I, I don't forget that day where this family was in, a, in, in quite a crisis. Um, you know, they've been evicted from their home. Um, they come to school, they're an absolute mess. Mum and dad are crying they're talking about all sorts of things. And, and as a chappy, you're like, great, I was just expected to come to work, finish <laughs> up, go home, um, celebrate my little girl's birthday. But yet you're in crisis mode trying to support this family and you know that this is going to be an all-day thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know that from trying to help them find a home to helping them move out, uh, which had to be that day, and this family is just hysterical, um, it took up all of my day. Yeah. And I remember driving home late and sort of missed everything and, and it was a real special moment with God because it was like, well, it's very easy to just say, well, no, my little girl comes first 
Um, but I had a sense of peace, and I think we've, we've had a sense of peace in the moments that it's right. Yeah. I don't think that you have to say yes to everything. I don't think that you have to go out um, and, 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 and sell yourself for absolutely everything, every need that people have. But there are moments that you will be challenged and you will send something in here where it's, 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 it's a, some type of a crossroads or a crucible where it's like God's actually asking me to uh, give up a part of myself and my family here because it's something deeper than just the act of helping someone. And it's actually God trying to build something in you and your family. And, um, and that's the altar. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the real spiritual altar um, that we have in our homes. Yes. Um, because we know when it's time to honour God, um, even in those practical ways. So I think counting the cost is, is, is for me and for us uh, often has been, okay, well, is this thing that seems like an inconvenience or a, or, or, or a little thing that we could easily just say, no, that's not our job yeah. um, because it's going to inconvenience our family. Um, but yet God's saying, no, I actually want you to do this. And yeah, anyways. So um, the way that you guys do this together then, because obviously it's just not you on your um, doing this. It's a family. Uh, my understanding from what I've heard is you really look for that peace in that in that moment together. Yeah, yeah and I is think that the, is that how you do this together? It is. And, um, Pastor Jared, Pastor Jared, just before was just talking about you know hearing God. Yeah. It may, may not always come in, in the thunderstorm or lightning. It, yeah. Sometimes you have to inquire of God uh, more than once, more than twice, um, and God just puts a peace in your heart. We've had those moments where there's a decision that needs to be made and we it just doesn't feel right. It may not be feel right for one of us or both of us, um, but at, when we know it's God speaking to us, God will just put a peace in. When we were moving to Toowoomba, he said, oh, we're going to move to Toowoomba. And I was like, I was like, ready. I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and that's what God does is he's just yeah. like, you know, I could have said no. My family is all in, in back home in, yeah. in Brisbane, Logan area. And I just said, no, God, God had called us for that time and God had put a peace about it. We knew it was coming. God had spoken to us prior. You know, it, it, it's always a process that God takes us through. It's like he speaks mm. to us. And it may not always happen initially or straight away. Um, it could happen, you know, th- in this instance, it happened two years. The Toowoomba move was a two-year process yeah. where God spoke and we did. But I was just going back to what Carlos was saying um, about counting the costs and you know, throughout time uh, with him being a chaplain and even in, in, in our journey, like God has just been amazing. And where we're doing what God has called us to do, he's provided the blessing where there's been a need. There's been, you know, the the mystery people like, you know, paying for groceries and people that don't even know our need because we, we've never gone and said, oh, we're in need. It's always been God sees it. God provides it. And that's yeah. been an amazing thing to see. And, it, you know, we reflect back. And we giggle because we're like, we don't know how we did this, but God <laughs> has just moved us along. And, you know, in chaplaincy, um, you don't see, it's it's not a huge pay that you get, but I think for us it's been rewarding to see God's hand. Um, and don't let that be a fear of just stepping into what God has called you to do because what God has called you to do with that, he'll, like, back it up. And yeah. we've seen his hand just been amazing. We have so many stories uh, that we could share about, you know, lack of time. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, obviously, when people hear the word chaplain, there's often a lot of perceptions and understandings that um, are, are formed in people's minds about what a chaplain actually does, you know, become a chaplain. Does that automatically mean that I have to tell everybody about... Jesus kind of thing. Is that the motive behind chaplaincy? Is that what a chaplain does? What's, yeah. Um, I guess not really. <laughs> this is a short answer. But, um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this a fair bit even just over the last week. Um, now in my role overseeing a district and uh, recently I moved into a different area and now trying to reshape and, I guess, hear from God about what is the vision for that community and, um, you know, even this week I was just thinking chaplaincy really is like, like a net. Mm. You know, the, I see chaplaincy as a net, you know, um, a net that catches those that fall, can fall through the gaps. Yeah. Um, that's how I see chaplaincy, no matter what context it is, whether it's sports chaplaincy, school chaplaincy, prison chaplaincy, hospital chaplaincy. Um, the chaplains have a flexibility 
And, and the beautiful thing about chaplains is that they are uniquely and distinctly, they're Christian people. Yeah. So they're people that have the flexibility to actually hear from God about where they should be. Yeah. And that for me is the key because everybody else has a place they have to be. They're paid to be in that place. Yeah. The chaplain, whether it's voluntarily, whether it's a paid position, that doesn't matter. What makes a chaplain so beneficial is that they can be where God asked them to be. Yeah, well, that's so for me, that's a special thing about chaplaincy. Yeah. Because you get to go, whether it's a, the sports club, whether it's at the hospital, whether it's in prison, you get to be led by God as to who you should be interacting with. And therefore, what happens is, you're actually reaching the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're not having to go through this list of, of, you know, like a triage list of like, we want you to deal with this caseload. Yeah, you'll have a bit of that, but really the chappies are hearing from God. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, for example, I just love the network of chaplaincy. That's why I see it as a, as a net. Um, I was sharing with Jess just the other day when we were talking about this. And, you know, I worked with a, a, young, a young boy when I first started out in chaplaincy years and years ago. Um, he was in primary school. I uh, went out to meet with someone the other day and I hear this young boy is not, no longer a young boy. He's now an adult and uh, he finds himself in prison. And yet he had asked about his chappy from primary school yeah. um, to this person and so instantly I just thought, what can I do? Um, if you know how, it, it can be hard to get into prison to visit someone. It takes quite some time to put an application and all that sort of thing. But the flexibility of being able to reach out to a prison chaplain yeah. and say, hey, here's this young fella's name. This is where he is. And then hearing back almost instantly that, hey, someone's going to go see this young fella on Monday morning. Yeah. That is amazing. Yep. And so that is, I think, the most special thing about chaplaincy yep. is that we can actually catch those that fall through the gaps and we have that flexibility to actually reach them when God actually is preparing them for at those specific times. Yeah, it's really good. I think, um, I mean, I love what Pastor Brennan was sharing this morning around communion and this idea of truth. And, um, you know, the scriptures say um, Jesus came in grace and truth. And uh, I think even from my own experience, you have an opportunity to give the grace, but also to give the truth that they need in that situation to um, empower them to overcome, um, you know, maybe an addiction or a situation or all that kind of thing. And um, I know that's certainly something that you guys have seen and, and even in this gentleman's life as well, um, being able to speak what they needed to hear in that moment. Um, and, and yeah, which is really cool. Look, if there's um, any encouragement you guys could leave with us today as we finish on Chaplaincy Sunday, maybe for um, anyone contemplating a journey that into chaplaincy that is yet to initiate it, or even just um, around the idea of being others focused, what would that be for each of you? <laughs> I think, um, you know, I love hearing the stories, you know, who Pastor Jason share his stories at his school, and I think initially that's what Carla sharing those stories with me is what really started to burn the fire, you know, about joining um, SU Australia. Um, but, you know, I just want to encourage you, like, just, you know, for, for us, it's, it, it's just being just trusting in God and putting aside everyone else's um, opinions and thoughts and um, just saying this is where God has us because... Um, yeah, this is where God wants us, this is where God has us, and, and just trusting, um, trusting that, you know, if you've got that calling, if God's putting that into your heart, just like maybe just listen and inquire of God a little bit more, and, you know, one of the verses that has really helped uh, me in supporting Carlos Drew's job is, uh, you know, Matthew 6, 26, um, um, and I'm sorry, I just quickly had it here, um, and I'm sure we all know it off by heart, but it, uh, it says, but seek first the kingdom of his right and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, and that's been a truth for us, you know, yeah. just trusting God in every step that we have with, within the chaplaincy journey and even as a, as a family. Mm. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, I just want to finish with, um, I guess, my my life verse over this journey has been um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And um, it just says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And for me, it's just those words, my grace is sufficient, have been enough to carry me through uh, moments of uncertainty or where I feel like I lack wisdom or I feel inadequate um, or I feel like I don't belong in a certain place because there's definitely been a lot of that for me, um, sitting in rooms and spaces where it's like, what am I doing here and what can I contribute? Uh, but God just positions you there. For me, this has been really important. So my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And so I would just encourage anybody who's, who's thinking about chaplaincy uh, in any context, um, you know, and you feel like, well, I don't know if I could do that. Uh, yeah, you can because um, God says you can. And if he's putting that, that little desire in your heart, um, or even if it's at work, you know, that this whole idea of accidental counsellor or accidental chaplain, like there's so many people out there that could just use um, what you have, what's deposited in you um, from God and just your, your personal faith in him. So, yeah, I, I just encourage you, uh, step out and, um, and just trust him. His grace is efficient. Yeah, that's fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, she girls. Hey, I, I, honestly, thank you um, for sharing, for um, willing to have this conversation with us. I knew you'd be a great encouragement for, I know certainly for me, but also for the greater body here as well. And um, I just, and not even just through the way, the things that you've said this morning, but also through your actions, you know, as individuals constantly positioning, your, positioning yourself to be readily available, but also as a family, as a network, navigating that in a way to honour and to always be ready to respond to the call and the move and just being available to others and to love people. And so I just take this moment to thank you. Thank you what you've done for our community as well in Toowoomba. Thank you and we honour you both and we celebrate with you all that God is doing in you and through you and will continue to do in and through you. So on, come on church, let's, let's honour these incredible people here this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> well, how amazing are Carlos and Ceci are, hey? Um, such an incredible family. And um, yeah, so Chaplaincy Sunday. Can you believe we're already through it? That went so quick. Uh, but uh, obviously we love to use this time uh, in our service to highlight the incredible work of our chaplains. And, um, but not only that, to also uh, look at this heart and the spirit behind chaplaincy, which is just that loving upon others. You know, God has called us all to love one another, love Him and love one another. And so um, here at Civic, you know, when it comes to chaplaincy, it's something we're very serious about and we are committed. It's only a fairly new ministry, uh, but we are committed to advancing chaplaincy uh, in this community and through this church network. And um, we do that by providing training pathways, accreditation, and bringing uh, leadership and support around our chaplains uh, to ensure an effective placement in our community. Um, and not only that, you know, uh, I love Carlos said something to me this week about, advent, about the, there's a little chappy in all of us believers here. There's a little chappy in all of us. And, and I really believe that um, as we move forward into this chaplaincy space, Something where we're going as a church is advancing the little chappy in us all, empowering you all and equipping you all in your workspace, whether you carry that title or not. And the way we're doing, we're, we're, the way we are looking at that is um, connecting with Sports Chaplaincy Australia to provide actual training and support to empower anybody who wants, who just has that heart to be ready available to um, people in their big moments uh, of life, especially. So, um, 
yeah, which is just which is really cool. I'm excited to be able to be a part of that. So if if you are interested to know more about chaplaincy, um, you have questions, or or maybe you're just in that space where you're like, hey, how can I uh, help a chappy out? Um, come and chat with myself or any of the pastoral team, even your Connect host as well, and uh, begin that conversation. It's worth exploring. As Ceci has said, you know, if it's a God thing, if it's God's talking to you, and as Carlos affirmed as well, you can do it. And He will provide the way. He will make it possible for each and every one of us that feel that call and that move and that desire to support people. And so... Um, if, if you want to chat with us or if you don't have time, pop your name down at the kiosk. Sound good? Wonderful. I'm going to ask um, our senior pastor, Pastor Brendan Kelly, to come now and just to pray for all our chappies. Thanks, Pastor Brendan. Thanks, Jess. And uh, I want to give a huge shout out to Pastor Jess, who leads and heads up our chaplain's ministry. Come on, give it up for her. I can tell you now there's no little chappy in her. She's a huge chappy in her. And uh, she's, in, she's pretty infectious, I'm hoping the right way. Um, I don't know what's going on with your voice right there, girl. But anyway, um, you, you made it. You made it. I know where you got it from. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, I just loved every bit of that. And I hope you did too. I loved listening to Cecia and Carlos. Hey, by the way, we just love having these guys in our church. Come on, give it up for those two guys. And I might add, I know you asked for three things, but I'm so glad that he said there's a fourth one. I'm going to take you to the church that's just for you. All right? <laughs> We're glad to have you here. We loved having you here. Uh, listen, I just love the idea that chaplaincy, as uh, we've been hearing this morning, is about loving on our city being able to love on our city and our broader community. Uh, chaplaincy is, is not limited to just what's going on in the four walls of the church. It's about getting out into our community. It's about listening empathetically and caring. Carlos made that statement right at the front. He said, I just found people wanted to talk to me because I was willing to listen empathetically and caringly. Um, be ready to answer the call, team. Be ready to answer the call. Be ready to provide practical help. Be ready to be inconvenienced. Chaplaincy is like a net. You have the flexibility to be where God asks you to be and reach the people God wants you to reach. I love all of that. It summarises the whole thing about chaplaincy. And so as you've already been hearing this morning from Pastor Jess, if inside you you're thinking, I don't know what this is, but there's something going on on the inside of me. Don't ignore it. Go and have a chat with Jess or Carlos Cessia or any of the team, anybody. Just, just have a chat. Get the conversation started about what's going on. What is this thing that I'm, I'm sensing in my heart? Come on, let's pray for all of our chappies. And so, Father, as we come this morning and we celebrate our chappies, our chaplains, chaplains and the, chap, the, the ministry of chaplaincy, Father, we do thank you for the gifting for the Lord, it truly is a gifting on their lives and that they have that call. Father, we thank you for their giftedness to be able to not just shine, but to serve you by serving others and be ready, being ready to answer at any time. Father, we understand that in these kind of willingness, there can be a lot of actual sacrifice and selfless sacrifice. There can be so much need for a courage to get out and do this thing. We thank you for the passion and the conviction that our chaplains have. And so Father, we thank you for all that you have done in their lives. And basically you have given them as a gift to our community. We believe, Father, as they go, it is truly fulfilling for them because they honestly know that they are able to be right where you want them to be, reaching just who you want them to reach. And that at some point, those who they reach may want to ask the questions, the real questions about the truth and the life 
of course, ask questions about you. And so, Father, we pray for our chaplains and we thank you for them. We pray, Father, that even in those quiet times when none of us would know, but you hear their prayers, you see their tears. I believe, Father, that in so many times they understand they're actually being carried by you and that they can rest from the tireless work because you're the one that's actually sustaining them and you're carrying them. And we thank you then, Father, for all that you are about to do, not what you have already done, but what you are still going to do through chaplains and chaplaincy. And again, Father, we pray for every single one, every single one called to the ministry of chaplaincy, that they would be ready to answer the call. You alone are worthy of being glorified. We give you all the praise and all the honour in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God so bless you this morning. Thanks for coming to church. Before we go, we're going to sing one last song.